Hi, hello, and howdy, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining me today. I am your host, Josh Waters, and this is Rotten to the Core, the history podcast where I take a bite out of some rotten people. We go into their upbringing, crimes, and mental afflictions, and try to form a better view of how, well, they became so rotten. We're all the same species, and I'm curious about how someone, human, the same as me, can do things so dark and twisted. This is a special episode, so we won't be going over a particular person today. Instead, the rotten person is homophobia and the history of it in the United States. We will be going from the Native Americans pre-colonialization to today. So, please take a seat and grab a napkin because the tea will be spilled. Well, it is about the middle of June, schools are out, but today, class is in session. June is, as I'm sure you're aware, Pride Month in the U.S., and if you haven't pieced it together, I am of the homosexual inclination myself. I do believe I was born this way, but let me say I would choose it all 526,600 minutes of the year. Well, maybe every day of the year, but on Taco Tuesdays. Now, coming from the Bible Belt in rural Indiana, I won't say there haven't been challenges. I am a tall, bottle blonde beanpole, as I've been told. That's talking about height. And I'd be lying if I said I don't get anxiety going into large crowds. Especially in today's trigger-happy world, I do sometimes feel like an easy target for the next hot-headed person with a permit to carry at the grocery store. Age, though, has brought wisdom, and now that I'm in my 30s, I go by the saying, a life lived in fear is no life at all. And that has helped me a lot. The people I've met, befriended, helped, and had the opportunity to know have made living my truth the thing I am most grateful for. I know I wouldn't have the freedoms today if it weren't for the sacrifices and struggles of so many before me. I do feel somewhat shameful admitting this, if I could feel shame, but I don't know much about my own gay history before this episode. Now, every day is an opportunity to grow and learn, so here we are. In today's episode, we will be learning about the history of homophobia throughout the United States. Again, our story will start with the indigenous people of North America, and from there we will strut our way through colonialization and throughout the development of this country. We will be learning the crimes, laws, and hate that have shaped us into some of the bravest and most resilient people. So, get ready to clutch your pearls as we go together into the horrible history of homophobia in the United States on this episode of Rotten to the Core. If you ask a lot of people, they will tell you that the United States is a young country, which it is at the age of 245 years old. That's nothing compared to countries like Iran, which have been around since 3200 BC. That's over 5,000 years old. But the continent of North America wasn't just sitting empty. The indigenous tribes arrived here over 15,000 years ago. And before the colonizers brutally and forcefully flipped the script, had such a vast, beautiful, and flourishing history. One of which, individuals who identified as what would be eventually called homosexual, had more respect and rights than they would again until present time. More, actually, than in some ways. The term Two-Spirit was coined in 1990 at the Indigenous Lesbian and Gay International Gathering in Winnipeg and specifically chosen to distinguish and distance Native American or First Nations people from non-Native peoples. It was created in English to serve as a pan-Indian unifier. Two-Spirit is used within some Indigenous communities, encompassing cultural, spiritual, sexual, and gender identity. It reflects complex Indigenous understandings of gender roles, spirituality, and the long history of sexual and gender diversity in indigenous cultures. You know, just writing that made me (laughs) misty-eyed. It has so much reverence for those who fall under the two-spirit identity. It's just so different from the teachings I grew up with. For example, God doesn't make mistakes. And my classic favorite, 
If a man also lie with another mankind, he is lieth with a woman. Both of them have committed an abomination. They surely shall be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. That's what I grew up listening to. I was a very literal child, believing everything I was told as truth, because in my house growing up, the worst thing you could do would be to lie. You can imagine the fear I had as I grew older and started to realize I was gay. It didn't take long. <laughs> I was terrified to even think about it because I was always told God knows your heart and everyone has been teaching me that he hates and kills gays. Well, I was just waiting for either a bolt of lightning or the devil himself to rise up with my contract ready at any moment. Literally, I was a very literal child. <laughs> I thought that admitting to myself that I was gay meant the same thing as being evil, which was the very last thing I ever wanted to be. Traditionally, Native American two-spirit people were male, female, and sometimes intersexed individuals who combined activities of both men and women with traits unique to their status as two-spirit people. In most tribes, they were considered neither men nor women. They occupied a distinct alternative gender status. In tribes where two-spirit males and females were referred to with the same term, the status amounted to a third gender. In other cases, two-spirit females were referred to with a distinct term and therefore constituted a fourth gender. Most indigenous communities have specific terms in their own languages for the gender variant members of their communities and the social and spiritual roles these individuals fulfill. With over 500 surviving Native American cultures, Attitudes about sex and gender can be very diverse. Even with the modern adoption of pan-Indian terms like two-spirit, not all cultures will perceive two-spirit people the same way or welcome a pan-Indian term to replace the terms already used in their cultures. The disruptions caused by conquest and disease, together with the efforts of missionaries, government agents, boarding schools, and white settlers resulted in the loss of many traditions in native communities. Two-spirit roles were singled out for condemnation, interference, and many times violence. As a result, two-spirit traditions and practices went underground or disappeared in many tribes, replaced with the colonizer's more rigid view of male and female roles in society. Well, all good things must come to an end. And that's exactly what happened once the Puritans were aware of the, in their view, barbaric customs of the Native American tribes. Treatment of the Two-Spirit people. I mean, how dare they treat someone different with respect, kindness, and love? Oh no, not in their new world. In the early Puritan colonies, the mere concept of homosexuality struck horror into the hearts of good, God-fearing men. Many thought that homosexuality was an impurity that could spread and eventually call down the fire and brimstone that was showered on Sodom and Gomorrah. To preserve the sanctity of the Puritan culture, to assure that their new Jerusalem did not turn into a new Sodom, the Puritans prescribed the death penalty for all homosexual offenses. This penalty was also applied to other sex crimes, such as rape and adultery. So basically, back then, just keep it in your pants. It's not worth it. Keep it in your pants. The Mathers wrote quite a few works on the subject. Cotton Mathers addresses to old men, young men, and children. Pillars of Salt, The Sailor's Companion, and Increase Mathers' Solemn Advice to Young Men were all at least in part intended to cure New England of the pollution caused by homosexuality. These works drew on a few lines in the Old Testament to back up its fear of gays. I remember growing up that the Old Testament was used often to educate me on how wrong I was for being gay. I do remember though flipping the script on a preacher once using the same tactic. Leviticus says not to eat shellfish use mixed seeds or fabrics, and harvest the corners of fields. Matthew says, if your eyes cause you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. His response, though? Well, that's all Old Testament. It's different after the birth of Jesus and into the New Testament. Some things you just have to walk away from for the love of hypocrisy. God bless. God bless. You all know what that means. 
Since church and state were synonymous in Puritan New England, the laws shared the same source and portrayed much of the same fear. These laws were derived from the Old Testament chapters of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Judges. Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13 call for the deaths of men who engage in homosexuality. Most of the Puritan laws adhered strictly to the Bible's wording as only homosexual men were subject to severe punishment. Female homosexuality was excluded in most cases, although they still didn't want that happening. The first recorded trial ever for homosexuality in New England resulted in two non-capital sentences. John Alexander and Thomas Roberts were found guilty of lewd behavior and unclean carriage with each other by often spending their seed upon one another. Oh my. This case held all the elements for conviction. There was a witness and each of the young men confessed to the acts. If the law books had been followed to the word, these two men would have been eligible for the death penalty. Yet, for some reason, the magistrate gave them a lighter sentence. Alexander was sentenced to a whipping, was burned on the shoulder, and then banished from the colony. Roberts was also whipped, and being an indentured servant, he was returned to his master. In addition, Roberts was banned from ever owning land in the colony. God, that's such a harsh punishment for what would be, by today's standards, maybe a usual Friday night. It's just two guys having some fun together rolling around in the woods. What? Don't judge me. Like I'm the only one here who's ever mixed a margarita in a sailor's mouth. Can you guess what my favorite show is? <laughs> one plausible explanation is that fewer were executed because homosexual encounters were more common and possibly were common knowledge. People would find it difficult to put someone else to death for an offense that someone they knew or possibly they themselves had previously committed. It is likely, for instance, that on the frontier, a great many men participated in homosexual activity. Frontiersmen were voluntarily isolated for long periods of time away from women and all male communities. Homosexuality may have been situational for some, a result of lack of heterosexual activities, and others may have chosen to be in such situations. Oh no, please, I hate this. The frontier was not the only place where an all-male environment existed. Schools were also usually all-male institutions. Thomas Shepard, a very influential and sometimes feared minister, wrote in his diary that he had homosexual experiences while away at school. I was once or twice dead drunk and lived in unnatural uncleanness, not to be named an in speculative wantonness and filthiness. Oh my! These men who experienced homosexuality were brothers, uncles, sons, or friends of the magistrates, ministers, and outstanding members of the community back home. This could put a magistrate in a dilemma of hypocrisy, attempting to judge one person based on homosexuality when he knew someone close to him could be very well guilty too. <laughs> Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Let's be honest, guys. Burnout is real. I worked in a nursing home during the pandemic and lockdown in life enrichment. It was hell. Do you know how hard it is to try to make a building full of elderly ladies you love happy every day when you feel numb inside more and more? I ended up needing to leave the entire field because my burnout was so bad. It always seems that I was in a caretaker role throughout my life, for everyone but myself. When I found my therapist on BetterHelp, I was desperate for some guidance out of my hole. Talking with her, I've been able to start finding my joy again. It's like chatting with a friend. And I even started journaling per her recommendation, but it has helped me get out of my head a lot and a lot of my built up emotions that I didn't realize I even had until I started writing it out. The weight off of my chest was just the beginning of my mental health journey with better help. Don't put yourself on the back burner of burnout. Take a hold of your mental health today and start putting yourself first for a change. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. 
Our listeners get 10% off of their first month at betterhelp.com slash core. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash core. As a man, I can say that we're often overlooked in the clothing department, especially for something that not only looks good, but is comfortable as well. Cuts Clothing gives me life with their top quality shirts. They're so nice and versatile, I can wear them with shorts, running errands, or with my pants at work. I know I look good when I slip on my cut shirt or my personal favorite black hoodie. As soon as I opened my first package from Cuts and felt the material of the shirt and how soft and just well made it felt, I knew I had found a winner. I wear the t-shirts the most and my favorite color is blue. I have washed them several times now and they have kept their gorgeous color. I know when I put on one of my cut shirts, long sleeves, or hoodies, I know that I look good and I'll be comfortable all day long. Refresh your wardrobe in time for summer with Cuts. See for yourself why Cuts is one of the fastest growing men's brands with over a million shirts sold. Get 15% off your first order by going to cutsclothing.com slash rotten. That's C-U-T-S clothing.com slash rotten. The issue of homosexuality was used as a tool for propaganda as well. The Puritans accused the Quakers of being a society that harbored homosexuality because the Quakers had long hair. Long hair to the Puritans was a sign of being feminine, which the Puritans considered for men to be any bit effeminate was on the road to being gay. The Puritans would accuse other faiths of homosexuality to prove that God loved them the most. Children fighting over a sky daddy's attention, I swear. Moving forward, did you know that sodomy used to be illegal? I know a few married women who still wish it was so their husbands would finally stop asking, but... I'm not just speaking about homosexuality, but the act of sodomy itself, whether it was two men or a man and a woman, was a condemnable offense in the 1600s up to the 1960s. Those laws prohibited the unnatural acts of anal sex and bestiality. In the eyes of the ones making the laws, there was no difference. The act of sex should be used to procreate more worshipers of God. Anything other than that was deemed unnatural and wrong. Yeah, well, tell that to my G-spot. Beginning in England during the reign of Henry VIII in 1533, the view of sodomy was a crime, was brought to British America by colonists and recorded in newspapers and law books alike. Sodomy laws would continue to adapt and change after their initial creation in the colonial era, from a common law offense to a clearly defined criminal act. Sodomy laws were not meant to persecute homosexuals specifically, They were meant to prevent the moral corruption and degradation of society. The definition of homosexuality is continued to adapt and change as the laws have changed. Although sodomites have been treated differently in America and England, being a sodomite had the same social effects on the persecuted individual in both countries. I hate that word. It just, sodomite. It ain't cute. The study of homosexuals throughout history is honestly a young field. It is a young field, but those who attempt to study this topic are often faced with the same issues. There are not many historical accounts of homosexuals themselves. This lack of sources can be attributed to their writings being censored, destroyed, or simply just not withstanding the test of time. Another problem faced by historians of homosexuality is that a clear identity for homosexuals did not exist until the early 1900s. There are two approaches to try to handle this lack of identity, though. The first is to only treat sodomy as an act and not as an identity, and the other is to attempt to create a homosexual identity for those convicted of sodomy. That's what I can't wrap my head around. Who gives a flying turd in space how people are banging one out. If it's between two consenting adults, it is no one's business. Isn't there anything more important to worry about than who's sticking what where? Good gravy. 
It wouldn't be until 1963 when Illinois became the first state to change its laws decriminalizing sodomy. During the 1960s and 70s, 17 states would repeal their laws while another seven only changed it to be illegal for heterosexual couples and a misdemeanor for homosexuals. I think I might have had a permanent cell at the police station if I were around back then. But what would they do if you got caught getting sodomized while in jail by the officers? Oops, I accidentally fell on him repeatedly. My bad. (laughs) Imprisonment and death weren't the only outcomes for being found out as homosexual, though. Did you know that it used to be labeled as having a mental illness along the lines of bipolar, schizophrenia, and multiple personality disorder? President Eisenhower even made it a crime for homosexuals to work for the government in any position, as we were deemed mentally unsound for those jobs. Having been around a lot of people from that time era, they have shared with me that they actually were afraid of us. Through propaganda, both from the governments and churches, the people I spoke with had an image of homosexuality that we were mentally ill, evil, child molesters who would spread disease and sin. Our goal being to seduce married men, ruin families, and bring about the end of days. Sodom and Gomorrah, there are still those today who believe that we are a sign of an apocalypse. If you've ever been yelled at by a Christian, it could be because that person honestly believed you were going to bring about the end of the world. Honey, why would we want the world to end? Then there'd be no more men left to play with. I'm just saying. Homosexuals weren't only sent to prisons or hospitals, though. Some admitted themselves, desperate to find a cure for what they believed could have been a mental illness. They were so scared of who they were, and they were desperate for any cure and a chance to live as a hetero in a world designed for them. It's the people like that who felt ashamed or unable to live their truth that I hold dear. Their stories give me the strength to just be myself, unapologetically. As we now know that homosexuality can't be cured because it's not a disease. And those people who willingly or forcefully were put in a mental hospital, such as the Government Hospital for the Insane in D.C., were subjected to cruel torment, pain, and experiments that more often than not would leave them as a shell of their former selves. Whether by a lobotomy stripping their minds or the inhuman treatment that completely ruined what mental ability they had, the people who managed to leave those places would start to suffer from actual mental illness or just being unable to cope would end their lives. That gave me chills just reading that. I am so truly sorry to those alive or dead who have suffered in that way. My heart goes out to you and... I hope you have found some peace with your spirit. Let's move on down the road a little bit and talk about, honestly, the biggest part of my homosexual history knowledge, the Stonewall Riots. Do gay men have sex in the woods? Well, yes, we do. And there's a reason for that. As we've been learning, being gay often meant to be secretive. We didn't have a lot of places we could go to be ourselves, which is also where bathhouses, gym hookups, and glory holes came from. People just couldn't risk the possibility of their neighbors seeing them or hiding in heterosexual marriages. It started with the woods and moved to there being actual gay bars for us to have a space to be free. Would you believe that the Stonewall was actually owned by the mafia? They used their influence to keep the police away as best they could and didn't care what was done there as long as their overcharged drinks were bought and money was being made. It wasn't a completely safe place, though. Even with the police being kept out, at least the straight ones, the mafia would often extort the wealthier patrons of the bar, threatening to out them to their employers or family. Even with the bribes, the bar would still be raided by police occasionally, charging people with solicitation of homosexual relations Individuals who identified as transsexuals were often the easiest targets and arrested for non-gender appropriate clothing. Well, if you have ever met a queen, you know that yes, 
We tend to be kind. We know what it's like to be hated, and we don't want to make others feel that way. But everyone has a limit. And on June 28, 1969, the mistreatment and hatred of them finally became too much. In the early morning hours, nine police officers entered the stone wall in a raid. What they didn't know is that the patrons were fed up. As police started to arrest resisting people inside the bar, outside, a storm was brewing. People by the hundreds started to riot, throwing bottles and pushing through barricades. The police, terrified, actually locked themselves in the stone wall to try to escape the crowd. The rioters weren't taking that as a possibility, though, and they set the bar on fire. More police arrived as backup, and the officers inside were able to get out alive. But then, though the angry mob had grown into thousands, and they wanted something done, the mob would be rioting until July the 1st. As we know from our current life, rioting is taken usually two ways. There are those in the public who are mortified by the Stonewall riots because they saw it as homosexuals attacking police. Those people were most likely already full of hateful ignorance towards gays. But there was another side that opened the rest's eyes to the injustices we faced as a community. The Stonewall riots were just the beginning of the modern gay rights movement and opened the door for other marginalized members of the community. It also started the formation of the Gay Liberation Forum, the first group to publicly advocate the equal rights for gays, and on the one-year anniversary of the riots, the first gay pride parade happened on June 28, 1970. And on June 24, 2016, President Obama made the Stonewall Inn and the area the riots happened a national monument. This became the first one to celebrate gay history, The riots were violent, yes, but it set our boundaries. No longer would we sit by and watch our rights be withheld and our people mistreated. Well, things have gotten a lot better for us over the years, but there are still fights to be had. I said fights, not riots. Yet, just kidding, do not riot. Currently, there are 27 states where there are no explicit statewide laws at all protecting people from discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity in employment, housing, and public accommodations. Mine included Indiana, I'm talking to you. Utah is the only current state that protects people in employment and housing, but not in public accommodations. The rest of the states and the District of Columbia protect people in all three. Today, I can freely work, live, and even get married if I wanted. If I wanted. Say that again. We have so many freedoms, but still with limitations in some. I get it. Not everyone is a fan. And some religions do condemn us. And that makes people not want to bake us cakes. I'm good with not going to those places, though. It honestly doesn't bother me. I am guilty of going to a certain craft and hobby store but I'm not gonna lobby there, wink. I don't go to Jesus Chicken, but mainly because it tasted like lemon pledge sprayed on a chicken sandwich to me, just to me, and the hate. The hate, I can't get past it. The history of homophobia in the United States is violent, condemning, and lingering. We have had to hide, fight, and reinvent ourselves, but we didn't do it alone. I wanted to thank all the allies who have helped, loved, and taken us in when our own families turned us out. I have been blessed to have had an amazing line of support over the years, and I truly wouldn't be here without them. It is a scary thing to go against the grain, and your support is eternally cherished. Oh, here is one little extra bit of info. Did you know why the L comes first in LGBTQIA2S+. It is an earned right that lesbians deserve. During the AIDS pandemic in the 90s, most hospital workers refused to treat the patients diagnosed with the disease, mostly gay men. And it was even referred to as the gay disease. In a beautiful show of compassion, lesbian nurses traveled the country trying to help as many as they could often being the only sign of kindness for most of the people suffering. That is why the L comes first, and a special thank you to those women.
There was so much of our history that I chose what resonated with me the most. I hope you learned something today and enjoyed this episode of Rotten to the Core, the history of homophobia. I am your host, Josh Waters, and thank you all so much for listening to me. And I hope you all have a fabulous day. Happy Pride, everyone. If you would like to stay up to date on our current episodes of Rotten to the Core or have suggestions for future ones, please follow and like us on Facebook at It's Rotten to the Core, Instagram at It's Rotten to the Core, Twitter at Rotten in History, or It's Rotten to the Core.com. <laughs>